Oh, All right. Hey, everybody. Thank you for coming. So uh, I wrote this new book um, over there. Hold on. I'm going to grab a copy because I'm going to refer to it later. Uh, I wrote this book, Homeland, and I'm, I'm going around the country with it, uh, walking, the, walking the land, as Samuel Jackson said. Uh, and um, uh, this is my 11th day uh, and my ninth city, and I have 22 cities in all. So if this is whatever day it is, it must be Cincinnati. Uh, I'm not going to read from the book because I've got a podcast of me reading from the book where I edited out all the parts where I got it wrong, and that will sound better than anything I'm going to read to you today. Instead, I'm going to talk a little about the book, but that's all right with you guys. Uh, and particularly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about some of the, the thinking that went into the book, the stuff that got me thinking about the subjects that end up making up his books. And it starts with a recent history lesson. Uh, so back in February of 2010, a kid named Blake Robbins uh, went and uh, sued his school district. Uh, Blake Robbins was a student in the Lower Marion School District outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Very affluent uh, school district. All the kids in his school had been given laptops, uh, MacBooks, that they took home every day, brought back to school every day. Uh, they had to do their homework on it. They had to deliver their assignments with it. All the assignments were given to them by it. So this was like a mandatory laptop, and that matters because of what happened next. So he filed this lawsuit in February 2010, and in the complaint, he explains what happened to him. Um, he and the principal had not gotten along, and they had they butted heads before it. He went into the principal's office, called into the principal's office one day, and the principal said, you know, I've got you now, kid. You've gone too far. You're taking drugs. He said, I don't take drugs. The principal said, oh yeah, explain this, and handed him a photo of himself in his bedroom the night before taking a pill. And he said, well, first of all, that's a Mike and Ike's candy. I eat them all the time. And second of all, how did you come to get a picture of me in my bedroom? And um, it, so the school, it turns out, when they gave the kids their laptops, they correctly assumed that some of them would get lost and some would get stolen. And so uh, they decided that they would um, put a kind of low jack on them, something to help them recover them if they were stolen. And what that was, was a piece of software that could covertly operate the camera without lighting up the green light. So they were only going to use that to, to like catch robbers, right? Except, you know, as Anton Chekhov says, you put a gun on the mantelpiece in Act 1, it'll go off by Act 3, or as, you know, Mr. Chekhov says, if you put a phaser on the gun. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so, uh, if you give school administrators the power to spy on children that they think are discipline cases, they will spy on children they think are discipline cases, and they had spied prodigiously on the kids in the school. They had taken thousands of photos of the kids in the school, awake and asleep, at home and at school, uh, dressed and undressed, sometimes with younger siblings or, or parents in the room. And, you know, in the aftermath of that, schools stopped putting spyware and not telling kids about it. They started putting spyware on and telling kids about it. They started putting spyware on and saying, by the way, this laptop that you're required to carry everywhere, we can look out the camera and you won't know when we are, so you better be on your best behavior all the time. Because it turns out, if you want to terrorize children into obedience, you don't have to keep it a secret that you're spying on them. You can tell them too. So I'm going to jump forward a bit uh, a year later, uh, eight months later, to November 2010 and to Bavaria, Germany. In, uh, in Bavaria, uh, the government there had been, was, um, again, concerned about people they had disciplinary issues with. And the Chaos Computer Club, which is a kind of hacker security group in, in Germany, they discovered that the, the Bavarian government had been hiding spyware on the laptops of people that they wanted to keep an eye on, illegally installing spyware on it. And like the stuff at Lower Marion, but a little more advanced, it let them do video off the camera, it let them listen through the mic, it let them grab uh, files off the hard drive, read the keystrokes, and so on. But here's the other thing, is that it turned out that when you, um, uh, when you infect people's computers with malware that hides what it's doing from them, um, and that takes active countermeasures to stop them from finding out what's going on, that uh, you then make those computers generically less trustworthy for them. Because it turns out that this software was badly written, and so you could go to like a Starbucks, or as they say in Germany, Sternbooks, uh, and uh, you could fire up a little network scanner, and you could find other people who'd been infected with the Bundestrojan, or the state's Trojan, uh, which is what they called it, Trojan being a name for malicious software, like a Trojan horse, the Bundestrojan, or you could find people with the Bundestrojan, you could uh, uh, 
insert yourself into the Bundestrian, or you could, you could, you too could open an account on it, and then thereafter you could follow that person around, and and look through their camera, listen through their mic, and so on. Now to skip forward again to September 2012, last last September, uh, and back to Pennsylvania, there were seven rent-to-own companies. These companies that will rent you something you can't afford to buy outright, so you make pay some money every month. And over time, you accumulate you know, enough payments that it belongs to you. Only it's not like the purchase price. It's like five times the purchase price, six times the purchase price. But if you're poor and you need something expensive to participate fully in life, it used to be car. With these guys, it was laptops. That might sound like a good deal to you. So these people, their customers, would, would go out and buy laptops this way, pay four or five or six times what the laptop would have cost, but they got to have a laptop and participate fully in our modern internet-connected society. And Designerware was the software company in Northeast Pennsylvania that these rent-to-own companies used for laptop security. And for them, laptop security meant that if someone skipped a payment, they wanted to be able to get the laptop back. So they did more or less what Lower Marion School District did, what the, what the German government did in Bavaria. They installed secret malicious software on the computer that let them operate the camera remotely and the mic and read the keystrokes and the hard drive and so on. So, Back in September 2012, these seven companies in Designerware had to settle with the Federal Trade Commission. And that's the federal agency run by the administrative branch that's in charge of making sure that companies don't abuse their relationships with us. And so um, the Federal Trade Commission uh, uh, came after them and they settled with the FTC and they stipulated, they admitted in their settlement that they'd done the following things. They had use the camera to secretly record, and there's some younger listeners here, so I'm going to use the euphemism here. They'd use the camera to secretly record the laptop owners being intimate. They'd use the camera to secretly record their children in the nude. They'd used the microphone to record their conversations. They had intercepted their banking logins and their financial details. They had intercepted their confidential medical records from their HMO and doctors. They had intercepted their privileged communications with their lawyers. And the Federal Trade Commission, they're a consumer protection agency, and as you'd hope, they, they said, you know, guys, you mustn't do this anymore. Stop it. You can't do this anymore unless you put it in the license agreement. Right? Wow. Because like the schools in America, it turns out if you tell people that you're abusing them, if you put it somewhere in that gnarly mess of thousands of words of ridiculous non-agreement agreement, that you can do anything. Now, um, we agree to a lot of agreements every day, more than I think we ever have before. It's pretty unprecedented in human history that you'd have to enter into a contract in order to um, ask your friends how they're feeling. But to use Facebook to ask your friends how you're feeling, you have to enter into a contract. And not just a little contract, a really big, long, hairy, gnarly contract that changes about <laughs> once a week. That you, that you would have to hire counsel and pay thousands of dollars to be fully apprised of. But you never would because you don't read it and lawyers don't read it and I don't read it. Nobody reads them. And the reason we don't read them is if you've ever read one, you've learned a couple of things. First of all, you don't really agree to any of the stuff in there. right? They, they are so abusive and one-sided that they amount to, by being dumb enough to use my service, you agree that I'm allowed to come over to your house and punch your grandmother and wear your underwear and make long distance calls and clean out your fridge. You know, so we, of course we don't read them. The other reason we don't read them is we can't negotiate them. What's the point of reading it if it's just, if, if, you, if it's a take it or leave it agreement, right? You, you know you're going to have to say yes at the end. Why not skip to the chase and save yourself the hardship of trying to plow through that gnarly, horrific legalese? So I think most of us probably assume that like the worst thing that would happen to us if those contracts turn out to be enforceable and really contracts and not just, you know, silliness, um, is that maybe we get sued, right? Because we violated a contract. That's what happens when you go back on a contract. They sue you, right? Not everyone has that view. Back in uh, 1986, Congress passed a law called the uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, or CFAA. And that's the uh, anti-hacking law in this country. Uh, before 1986, I really couldn't figure out what to charge hackers with. Was it trespassing? Did they steal a microwatt of energy when they used a computer? You know, what, what, what exactly was the crime here? So they wanted to define hacking. They didn't want to say if you use a computer that doesn't belong to you, you're a hacker be or a malicious hacker, the kind of hacker we want to put in jail. Uh, because um, that would be silly because, you know, if you check in at an airline kiosk, you use a computer that doesn't belong to you. If you swipe your payment card at a, at a, uh, a, a turnstile, you know, you, you use a computer that doesn't belong to you. 
They also didn't want to just make a list of the things you weren't allowed to do, because that would be even sillier, right? In 1986, you make a list of all the things you're not allowed to do with a computer. 1986.5, that list is out of date. So they needed to come up with an elegant solution that would be future-proof, and they came up with what they must have thought was a great idea. They said, if you do something you're not authorized to do with a computer, you are breaking the law, right? You're, you're committing a felony. And I think they probably thought they were very clever. Uh, but we live now in, a, in an era in which, A, we use computers that we don't own all the time, Facebook, email servers, Gmail, every time you use a search engine, every time you go through a turnstile, every time you get on the bus, every time you put your key card in the hotel lock, you use a computer that doesn't belong to you. And B, almost all of those interactions are governed by ridiculous fine print and legalese that's totally one-sided and abusive. And federal prosecutors in this country have started to take the view that those agreements are what you're allowed to do. And anything you do that violates the agreement is an unauthorized use of a system you don't own, and therefore a felony. Right? So here's what happens when you use a computer that, in a way that violates the license agreement, and somebody gets upset and they convince a federal prosecutor to get involved. The federal prosecutor comes over and says, uh, you know, you clicked 11 times, that's 11 felonies, that's, you know, 70 years in jail. Uh, but for you, because I like your face, we'll offer you a settlement. If you plead guilty, it's just three years in jail, right? And like 97% of the people in this country who are federally indicted, most people settle. They plead out and they go to jail because it's expensive to fight that. And if you, if you lose, if your lawyer isn't as good as theirs, uh, you go to jail for the rest of your life. So three years, as horrible as it sounds, even if you think you're innocent, turns out to be a pretty good deal for most people. They think that that's the deal that they'll take. But I'm going to talk briefly about someone who didn't take that deal and was uh, critical to the writing of this book. A uh, young man you will have unfortunately heard a lot about lately named Aaron Swartz. Now, um, Aaron was uh, uh, someone I knew for a long time, more than half his life. I met him in the year 2000 or thereabouts. He's about 14 years old then. And for those of you who don't know his story, he was a really bright young man. He, uh, at 13, he, he wasn't going to school anymore. He was just teaching himself because he was really kind of ahead of the curve, you know, blowing the grade, grade curve, as they say. And, and by 14, he was really involved in Internet standards. It was a thing he'd gotten super, like, geeked out about. And he was particularly was interested in something called RSS 2.0, which was a standard for one of the core standards of the internet, you know, RSS, moving data around on the internet. And he was participating in these like standards body mailing lists and really going at it hammer and tongs and making important changes to the standard as it was defined. And he wanted to go to the meetings in places like San Francisco. He lived in Chicago. And as you might imagine, his parents were a little anxious about saying, by all means, 14-year-old Aaron, we'll put you on a plane to Chicago and send you to San Francisco and you can come back at the end of the weekend, have a great time, right? So they didn't want to do that. But there was someone who could help out. Uh, the, there was a, a friend of mine, actually the woman I was dating at the time, wonderful person, we're still very good friends, a woman named Lisa Rhine, who was in that standards body, uh, also an XML geek, and like a pretty good facsimile of a responsible grown-up. And so um, she was the chaperone. She was the, she was the, the tail end of the, of, the, the, of, the, um, of the transaction. So mom would put Aaron on the plane in Chicago. We'd pick him up at SFO. I was living there at the time. We'd take him around. We feed him. He he was a terrible eater. He uh, he would only eat white food, <laughs> yogurt, plain pizza, toast, and plain rice. It was it was awful. <laughs> but for all that he was a terrible eater, you could tell that he was going to do amazing stuff, and he did. You know, he it, by 2005, he joined the company Reddit with the title co-founder, refactored their code base, made it what it is today, um, and was there when they got bought out by Condé Nast Wired and uh, moved into the same building as Wired in San Francisco and put behind desks, uh, which was like totally unsuited to him. <laughs> like so much so that uh, he basically, you know, I think almost without being able to stop himself, committed a breathtaking series of totally awful insubordinate acts in public that resulted in him being shown the door and forward vested and uh, wished all the best. And he did all the best. He, he went from there to doing even cooler stuff. By 2008, he was back in the news because of something called PACER, which is a federal database that 
we keep the uh, court uh, uh, files and decisions in in this country. So there's two kinds of law in this country. There's the law Congress makes, like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. You've seen the Schoolhouse Rock on Just a Bill video. You know how that law gets made, right? But that's not really law. That's like that's like it's more like the requirements <coughs> document for the law. The actual law, the source code of the law, is what the judges say. So you get charged with a crime. You go in front of a judge. Uh, assuming you go in front of a judge, and then you defend yourself, and the judge considers your case, and she looks into what all the other judges who've ever considered cases like yours have said, and she writes down her opinion, right? She writes a judicial opinion. She explains how your case fits into the jurisprudence, and that becomes part of the jurisprudence. And so there's a lot of jurisprudence, right? I mean, the laws that Congress makes, that's like a shelf. The laws that the judges have made, well, that's, you know, cases and cases of books, because the judges have written a lot in this country since it was founded. It's a lot of jurisprudence. And this is why, like to this day, if you're driving down the, the highway and there's a billboard for like 1-800-AMBULANCE-CHASER, there will be a guy in a cheap suit standing like this, and behind him will be cases and cases of leather-bound books, right? Because that's the symbol of a lawyer, someone who's got a lot of books with the judge law in it. Of course, these days, you don't look that stuff in a, in a book. You want index searchable text, right? So you look it up on, on a computer, you look it up on the internet, but not the same internet you and I use, because that stuff is not on the public internet. If you want to access PACER, this database, um, you have to pay. Now, there's a reason for this. When they first set up PACER, back in the Paleolithic era, the 1980s, computers were slow, expensive, and stupid, and you had to buy enormous bales of hay to feed the dinosaurs that made the treadmill go around, <laughs> right? So back then, they charged seven cents a page to access the source code to America. And, you know, you'd think that as time went by, they'd make it cheaper because now you can run it on like a pocket calculator, but they don't. Now they charge 10 cents a page. It's got more expensive. And you might have to search hundreds of pages before you find all of the case law that makes sense. And of course, if you don't know what the law says, you can't obey the law. Um, you can't know if you're breaking the law. You can't know if someone who's accused you of breaking the law is talking out of their, out of their bum or, or, is, or is, you know, has a point. Right? So we need to know what the law says. And of, and of course, the law is not in copyright. That, that would be crazy, right? Every democracy, every country with the rule of law since the Magna Carta has, uh, has believed and has enshrined the idea that citizens are allowed to write down the law, to copy the law, to tell other people what the law says. Secret law is antithetical to democracy. And so... Um, the documents in PACER don't belong to the government. They belong to all of us. And if you get a document out of PACER, you paid your seven cents or 10 cents, you can share it. But you know it's hard to do that systematically until some researchers at Princeton and some other activists got together and built a thing called RECAP, just like PACER, but a clever anagram. And RECAP is like a little browser plugin you install, connected up to an alternative database. And when you go to pay for a page from PACER, checks first to see whether or not anyone's paid for that same page in recap. And if they have, you just see their copy and you don't have to pay again. And if they haven't, you pay your dime and your page goes into the recap database and you don't have to pay and, and no one else has to pay again either. So what did Aaron do? Aaron went and he got the 20% of US case law that's most widely cited, a million, $1.5 million worth of federal documents. And he put them into recap, which was great. We all thought it was awesome. The FBI did not think it was awesome. <laughs> they started to surveil him. They started to open a file on him. They started to think about what they could do with him. They even brought him in for questioning with a lawyer. And um, he did what you should do if you're ever questioned by law enforcement. He asked to see a lawyer. Uh, in fact, I said this the other night at a, t at a talk like this I gave at a bookstore in San Francisco. And afterwards, a woman came up and shook my hand. She said, I work for the FBI. And I said, oh, yeah, what do you think of my advice to people who are questioned by the FBI? She said, it's good advice. So from the FBI's <laughs> mouth to you, asked to see a lawyer. Aaron asked to see a lawyer, and nothing bad happened to him. He walked away scot-free and went on to do more stuff. Unfortunately, that's where the problems really began. Because in 2010, he set his sights on something called JSTOR, which is another big database, a database of scientific and technical articles from journals mostly paid for with public money, mostly coming out of universities that where either they're public universities or receive public funding, sometimes from government agencies uh, and directly funded government research grants. And um, this stuff, this is like the core dump of the world. This is the thing that explains how the world works, what's actually going on inside the world. And that's kind of important because every couple of years, 
uh, our political classes come to us and ask us to vote for them based on their theory of how the world works. And it would be nice if we could see whether their theory of how the world works is experimentally verifiable, right? It's nice to know how the world works. And you can if you go to a big fancy university where they pay an annual subscription fee that lets all of their students access it. And you can if you go to a really nice uh, publicly funded school where they, they spend a lot of money on this. Um, and you can if you work at a big research institute, but you can't if you're poor. You can if you're just an average guy off the street. And you certainly can't if you're um, uh, university abroad with not much money in a developing nation. And all of those places are places where knowing how the world works benefits all of us too. So many of us in the, this side of the copyright wars had viewed that as kind of a, a terrible thing, a really awful thing. Pacer is kind of a national embarrassment. Aaron did something about it. He started to download Pacer documents. Uh, so he was a fellow at Harvard at the time. MIT was down the street. MIT is a big fancy private university. They have an open Wi-Fi network and it's connected to JSTOR. So Aaron started walking over to MIT with his laptop, connecting to their Wi-Fi and downloading thousands of articles, taking too many books out of the library. And they started to shut him down. The network administrators could see something was going on. They didn't know who was doing what, but they started to shut him down. He played cat and mouse with them for a while, got fed up, and decided to put a laptop in the wiring closet at MIT. So when you hear that, or if you heard the news reports, you probably think, wiring closet at MIT? That's like a level three biohazard containment facility. <laughs> but it wasn't. It was, uh, like, it was like the hallways in the buildings at MIT are traversed by the public regularly. This closet was one that the public used regularly. There was a homeless guy who kept his clothes there. It's just a closet. And Aaron put a laptop and plugged it into the network and downloaded millions of JSTOR documents. And that's when he was caught and federally indicted uh, and threatened with 50 years in jail. Now, unlike the 97% of people who are federally indicted, he didn't settle. He said, I checked too many books out of the library. You got me. That does not make me a felon. That's crazy. And they said, ah, but you violated the terms of service for this, uh, this system. And the terms of service spell out what you're authorized to do. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act says if you do something you're not authorized to do in a system that you don't own, you're a felon. So he fought it, and it was, a, it was a slow and really hard thing for him to be fighting on because, um, you know, they, it costs a lot of money to do, uh, and they fight dirty. Uh, there's documents even now that Aaron's defense are still waiting for that was supposed to be delivered years ago uh, in this case that, were, that would help his defense prepare, and they just don't deliver it. They just sort of stonewall, and the judges generally say, well, you know, you got extra time where you were a free man. That's not really detrimental to you, so I'm not really going to punish the prosecutors for doing this. And in the meantime, you have to pay your lawyers, and you run out of money. And when you run out of money, you don't have lawyers anymore, and that's when you go to jail. So Aaron was really upset about this, and trying his best to fight it, and trying his best not to let it get him down, and trying his best to do other stuff, and he did other stuff. In 2011, he was part of the coalition that fought and killed a stupid internet law called SOPA. You'll remember SOPA, that was the law that uh, resulted in children across America not being able to do their homework because Wikipedia went black. <laughs> and um, SOPA was a crazy, crazy internet law. It had lots of crazy, crazy features. The one that offended me the most was the what was called the uh, in, uh, intermediary liability piece, which is um, if you have a website where people can talk to each other, like a message board for your Little League team, you have to make sure they don't infringe copyright with what they post, which is hard because mm -hmm. infringing copyright is something that usually you need a long uh, law degree, a lot of legal experience to be able to determine uh, you know, for sure. But you are also responsible for making sure they didn't link to a website that infringed copyright. So you know, they linked to Tumblr. Now you have to go look at everything on Tumblr and make sure it doesn't infringe copyright. And there are some things you cannot unsee. <laughs> There's even a version of this law that said if you linked to a website that linked to a website that infringed on copyright, you were on the hook for the infringement. And that's where it gets like beyond the craziness because how could you have an internet where people can talk to each other? You know, you've got your Little League website, someone takes pictures, puts them on the Facebook, links to your message board. Now you're responsible for making sure that nobody ever links from Facebook to the Pirate Bay. That's, <laughs> that's just like not something you can ever be sure of. And so um, when I was in DC a week before the hearings for SOPA, you know, the people there, they said, you're wasting your time, go home. Uh, they have counted the votes. The industries that stand to benefit from this have supported the election campaigns of enough congressmen and senators uh, in, in significant enough ways that um, they're not going to vote against it. They've been given their marching orders. The uh, proponents of this bill have collected their signatures, and it's going to pass. There's, not even, there's only going to be one debate, right? Just, just go home. You're, you're wasting your time. 
Start thinking about what you would do in a world in which this was law, not what you would do to keep it from becoming law. But I didn't like that answer. A lot of us didn't like that answer. Aaron helped fight this. So did uh, the Fight for the Future kids in Worcester, Massachusetts, who are amazing. They're, they're three kids who met in math camp when they were 17 and are still best friends in their 20s and are responsible for this and many other amazing internet campaigns, but also EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and Public Knowledge off in DC, and so many other activist groups started to develop new ways of campaigning, not just petitions, because politicians had seen petitions before, and they had a big petition, but also things like, you fill in the petition, it looks at your zip code and goes, here's a like, voice over IP interface, press this button to call your senator now, right? Uh, Politicians, I think, correctly believe that they can't get elected without campaign contributions. What they quickly discovered is they can't get elected without votes. They got 8 million phone calls in 24 hours to the White House switchboard, and that was the end of SOPA and PIPA. And Aaron, I think, was very justly proud of what he'd done, as were so many of us, and thinking about what to do next. We made a thing called the CAT signal. The Internet Defense League has a thing called the CAT signal. The next time something like po SOPA goes up, there are hundreds of websites that have arranged to put up a picture of a cute cat and an alert. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, it was hard for Aaron because he was running out of money and the prosecutors would not offer a deal that didn't involve prison time. And uh, just over a month ago, he killed himself oh. in Brooklyn. Uh, and I'm sorry. Uh, it, we're still all trying to figure it out. And, you know, we make dumb internet law in this country. We make dumb device law in this country. We regulate the internet like it was glorified cable TV or next generation phone service, or, you know, God help us, like, pornography service. We don't understand in our lawmaking that the internet is something that we all um, use every day, and that tomorrow we will be required to use in everything we do. And so we get it wrong, and we continue to get it wrong. We got it really wrong in 1998 when we passed a law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is supposed to modernize American copyright for the digital age. It's, again, it's got a whole horror show of crazy things in it, but the one I'm going to talk about tonight, the one that's relevant to this, is something called anti-circumvention. And that says that if you have a device that has a lock on it that stops you from doing something the device would otherwise be capable of, like you've got a phone that uh, which should be able to connect to whoever's network you put a SIM in for it, but it's locked so it only does one network. Or you've got a Nintendo that should be able to play any game that will run on it, but it only run games that are signed by the Nintendo company so that they can collect some money in the deal. Or you've got a tablet, an iOS device, like a f an iPhone or, or an iPad, it only plays stuff where Apple's taken their 30% and bless the app again. If you've got one of those things and you remove the lock, even if you do nothing illegal, having removed the lock, even if you remove the lock for a legal reason, and even though the lock and the device are both your property, you have broken the law. You've committed a felony. First offense, five years in prison, $500,000 fine. Second offense, 10 years in prison, $1 million fine. Right? So there are researchers out there who discover stuff like there's laptops with cameras that turn on uh, and the owners don't know about it and people can look out of them. And they worry that if they tell people about it, they could go to jail. They worry that if they tell people about it, they could end up uh, where Aaron was. And there are people doing time now for doing things like discovering that AT&T was not protecting their customers' data. That if you went to your AT&T homepage, it would have a long, gnarly URL, www.att.com, blah, 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 and then a number at the end. And if you added one to that number, you get someone else's record. And there's, there's a guy in jail now for disclosing this fact. Right? alerting us all to the fact that AT&T had failed to secure our personal information because he settled. He didn't get convicted. He, he pled guilty because it was he didn't have an infinite... You know, Aaron had, a, had more than a million dollars, I think. I don't know exactly how much he had, but he had a lot of money from the Condé Nast thing, and he had rich friends, and he had the lawyers at Harvard at the Berkman Center. He was like, it doesn't get any better than, than Aaron's situation for, for those people. That's as good as it gets. That's not as bad as it gets. That's why everybody else settles. So I mention this because Aaron helped me write this book. And I knew when I was writing it that I wanted to have a next generation political campaign in it. Something where someone could get elected who would represent the voters. Something where you could get elected without a party machine behind you, without major donors. Where you could just use computers intelligently and networks intelligently to represent yourself to voters and have them vote for you and get into office and be responsible to no one but them. 
So I wrote to all these next generation campaign guys, mostly guys who'd worked on like Obama campaigns and, and uh, some Republican campaigns and the, and the uh, Howard Dean campaign. And they all had interesting things to say, but nothing I could use. And uh, so I thought, oh, I'll write to Aaron because he's, he's, he did all that cool stuff with Soap and Pipa. And I figured, you know, maybe he'd send me a few bullet points. And an hour later, he fired me back like shovel ready material. Uh, it was like basically four paragraphs describing what he called a uh, machine for getting votes that would let you get votes just on the strength of the passion of your supporters and not the money you raise or the party behind you. And it was so good that I basically pasted it straight into the book, except for the last two sentences, which were, got to go, I'm going to go build this. <laughs> right? And then I asked him to write an afterword for this. So the little brother, the one that comes before this and this, both have a pair of afterwords. And little brother, one's by Bunny Wang, who broke the Xbox and wrote a great book about it called Hacking the Xbox. He was an MIT grad student in engineering at the time. He wrote a book about reverse engineering. He wrote a book about reverse engineering and so on. And, and his essay is about that too. The other one was by Bruce Schneier, who's a security expert, who explained how getting it wrong about security means that we make ourselves less free and less safe at the same time. Again, a terrific, terrific essay. And this one I asked Jacob Applebaum, who's another friend of mine who, who uh, is a WikiLeaks volunteer and also works on the Tor project, the anonymity project, and he wrote me a great piece. And then I wrote to Aaron and I said, write me a letter to a kid who's 15 today, 14, 15 today, and tell me what you would say to them about changing this. I'm going to read you a little of it. So he's describing what he did about SOPA and PIPA and how they, they made their petition site and got 200,000 people in the first day. He says, well, the people pushing the bill didn't stop. They spent literally tens of millions of dollars lobbying for it. The head of every major media company in what flew out to Washington, D.C. and met with the president's chief of staff to remind him of the millions of dollars they donated to the president's campaign and to explain to him what they wanted. The only thing they wanted was for this bill to pass. But the public pressure kept building. To try to throw people off the trail, they kept changing the name of the bill. First it was COICA, then it was PIPA and SOPA, and then even the E-Parasites Act. But no matter what they called it, more and more people kept telling their friends about it and getting more and more people opposed. Soon, the signers on our petition stretched into the millions. We managed to stall them for over a year through various tactics, but they realized if they waited much longer, they might never get their chance to pass the bill. So they scheduled it for a vote first thing after they got back from their winter break. But while members of Congress were often on winter break, holding town halls and public meetings back home, people started visiting them. Across the country, members started getting asked by their constituents, why were they supporting that nasty internet censorship bill? And members started getting scared. Some went so far as to respond by attacking me. But it wasn't about me anymore. It was never about me. From the beginning, it was always about citizens taking things into their own hands, making YouTube videos and writing songs opposing the bill, making graphs showing how much money the bill's co-sponsors receive from the industries pushing it, and organizing boycotts that put pressure on the companies that supported the bill. And it worked. It took the bill from a political non-issue that was poised to pass unanimously and turned it into a toxic football no one wanted to touch. Even the bill's co-sponsors started issuing statements opposing it. <laughs> Boy, were those media moguls pissed. This is not how the system is supposed to work. A ragtag bunch of kids doesn't stop one of the most powerful forces in Washington just by typing on their laptops. But it did happen, and it can happen again. And you can make it happen again. The system is changing. Thanks to the internet, everyday people can learn about and organize around an issue even if the system is determined to ignore it. Now, maybe we won't win every time. This is real life after all, but we finally have a chance. But it only works if you take part. So that's the message. Uh, it only works if you take part. We live in a world made of computers and networks. This building is a computer we have put our bodies into. Take the computers out, it will be uninhabitable in a month. Your car is a computer you put your body into. Um, we increasingly put computers into our body. Uh, you know, those of us who are members of the Walkman generation and those of you who are members of the iPod generation, we will all need hearing aids eventually <laughs> because we have done irreparable harm to our hearing with our horrible headphones. And when we get a hearing aid, unless we're like Portland grade hipsters with artisanal, uh, you know, handmade transistor beige plastic hearing aids, we will instead get computers we put in our bodies. And those computers will know what we hear, 
and they'll be able to stop us from hearing things, and they'll be able to tell people what we've heard, and they'll be able to make us hear things that aren't there. And so it's pretty important that we get this stuff right, that we get it right so that knowing what our computers do and having free networks on which we can discuss it is our number one priority. It's the difference between a future in which the default posture of a computer is um, yes, master, and a future in which the default posture of a computer is, I'm sorry, I can't let you do that, Dave. <laughs> so this may all sound abstract. It may sound like the computers won't ever be in your body. But let me give you one more example from recent history. This from last November, just a couple of months ago, when a security researcher in Australia named Barnaby Jack gave a presentation at a conference on the research he'd done into implanted defibrillators. If you've got a faulty heart, uh, one that skips the occasional beat, maybe you've had a heart attack already, your doctor, when you go to see her, she can anesthetize you. She can open you up, spread your ribs, reach into your chest cavity, and attach a computer with a battery to your heart. And that computer monitors your heartbeat, and if your heart starts to falter, it can give you the kind of micro version of the paddles the EMTs would apply and get your heart beating properly. And of course they have wireless interfaces because doctors want to read their telemetry. And of course they have wireless interfaces that can be used to update their software because maybe there's new software for them. And this is where Barnaby Jack comes in because he showed that he could re reprogram your defibrillator from 30 feet. And he could reprogram it to seek out other defibrillators and reprogram them. And that at set intervals or at random times he could cause them to deliver lethal shocks to the people in whose bodies they were implanted. So we are not just in a world made of computers, we are made of computers more and more. And it's pretty important that we get this stuff right. Now there are organizations, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF.org, who I used to work for and who I'm still a fellow of, they're all listed in the back of the book. Groups like F Students for a Free Culture who do campus networks of student groups that work on this stuff. Um, and of course Demand Progress, the group that Aaron founded. Um, those are all groups that you can work on, but you can also just demand a better world, right? Demand to know why the computer that belongs to you is saying, I can't let you do that, Dave. Start paying more attention to how things fail than how they work. Yeah, the device works great, except it's designed to hide things from you. And if it's designed to hide things from you, then there is a Bundestrojaner in its future. There's a Lower Merion, Pennsylvania in its future. Our computers shouldn't hide things from us. So that's the talk, and there's one more thing I need to say, and then I'll take your questions, and after that, I will deface your books and render them non-returnable. <laughs> uh, and this is something I, uh, I told Aaron's family I would talk about. I, I spoke to Aaron's dad, and I told him I was going out on tour with the book, and uh, I told him I would talk about suicide and depression. Because it's not that um, Aaron was depressed and committed suicide. He was depressed and he committed suicide. And he had had struggled with depression before, but there's good reasons to be depressed, and one of them is that you're facing 50 years in prison. But other people have other reasons to be depressed. Sometimes it's bad home situations, or abusive situations, or economic desperation, or health problems, or um, just bad mind chemicals. But um, however bad it gets, the one thing you can be sure of is that if you kill yourself, you can't solve your problem. Uh, so all of us get depressed. Some of us, including me, have been depressed enough that it felt like the world would be better off if you weren't in it. But that doesn't mean that it's true. In fact, it's not true. You can't iterate from death. right? You can't say, that didn't work. What else have I got? We live in a world where our computers and networks tell us more about each other than ever before. If I watch your Foursquare, I know where you are. If I watch your Instagram, I know what you eat. If I watch your Facebook wall, I know what you're saying. But unless I ask you and unless I listen very carefully, I might never know how you're feeling. And that's something we haven't yet made part of our overall norm for the Internet, especially in techie circles. And I assume some of you are pretty techie because you're out at one of my events. <laughs> and it's something that we have to do. It's something we need to do with an, a conscious affirmative step because it won't happen automatically. It's something you really have to pay attention to. It's something I've resolved to pay attention to. And there's a thing I would have said to Aaron had he called me from Brooklyn before he killed himself. And it's something that I think all of his friends would have said to him, and variations thereof. Uh, and I'm going to say it to you, because I never got to say it to him. Uh, and maybe you'll get a chance to say it to someone, or maybe someday you'll think about it when you need to hear it. Whatever problems Aaron was facing, killing himself did not solve them. 
whatever problems Aaron was facing, those problems will go unsolved forever. If he was lonely, he will never again be embraced by his friends. If he was despairing of the fight, he will never again rally his comrades with his strategy and leadership. If he was soaring, he will never again be lifted from his sorrows and feel joy. Now it's a low note to end a presentation like this on, but the high note is that computers connect us more than we ever have been before. That it's possible for us to be kind in ways that our species has never experienced before. And if we do something about it, we can make it better. Thank you. So let's do 15 minutes of Q&A, and then we can do a book signing. And the, the high 13 people who are just slathered in awesome sauce over here, have, uh, they're going to run the 3D printer during the signing. Uh, so you, can, if you're, you don't have to queue up. You can go and watch uh, the miracle of volumetric printing, which is pretty awesome. So any questions? And I remind you that a, a, a long rambling statement followed by what do you think of that is a question, but not a good one. <laughs> Go ahead. Last Friday on Boing Boing, you mm -hmm. posted a link to an interview from Wedway Radio about the, the new Escape from Tomorrow movie that was mm -hmm. filmed at Disney, behind Disney's mm. back. Did you listen to the interview with the cinematographer? And I did. And thought on that film? Well, so that was pretty exciting. I haven't seen the movie yet. There's a movie called Escape from Tomorrow that was guerrilla produced in Disney World. They ran around with cameras and recorded a crazy surreal movie in, in Disney World. And the, the funny thing is I've been in a movie that was shot without permission in Disneyland. <laughs> There's a movie called Rip Remix Manifesto and they like so they came out to see me. I was living in LA at the time. I was at, I was at the University of Southern California. I live in London now. And they came out to see me and they were like um, uh, after we finished doing like this two hour interview, they said, right, let's go to Disneyland. I was like, really? What, for, to go on the rides? And they're like, yeah, but we're going to record you. I'm like, I don't think they let you do that. Like, It'll be okay. And they had a, like a DSLR on a, on a monopod that just looked like something, they looked like photo buffs and not like, not like film crew. And I had a lav, a wireless lavalier mic that was very unobtrusive. And they, they got an interview with me on the Dumbo ride. Uh, and so it was, it was like the only time I'd ever lined up for Dumbo into, before then, too. I always skip that one. And, and so I'm, in, I'm, I'm intrigued to see how this one goes, having been there. It, it, there, it, there's something very thrilling about um, doing stuff you're not allowed to in Disney parks. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Um. Is some of the same copyright computer the issues going on in London as well? Oh yeah, this stuff is a global madness. Um, partly because the U.S. Trade Representative has successfully exported it to most of the world, and actually, uh, in some ways, America has it better only because America has strong-armed other countries into making it worse. So, like when Russia wanted to enter the uh, the World Trade Organization, uh, the WTO, the U.S. Trade Representative. And the WTO insisted that they adopt modern copyright legislation. And that modern copyright legislation includes the presumption that if you have a copyrighted work, you have pirated it unless you can prove otherwise. And so this is, of course, very selectively enforced primarily against dissident newspapers that say bad things about Vladimir Putin. And they go in and they say, can you prove that the um, operating systems on these computers are licensed? They say, yes, we have the boxes with the holograms and the serial numbers. And they say, can you prove that those aren't counterfeit? And they take all the computers away, and they find out who their anonymous sources are, and they uh, stop them from publishing, right? So this is actually, like, not, not as bad as it is in the rest of the world. Of course, you know, the, the long game for this, historically, with copyright legislation, is to get another country to adopt something you couldn't get through the legislature here, and then uh, enter into a trade agreement with them where you were, are required to harmonize laws, and then, and then harmonize uh, upwards, as they say. Um, you know, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act has its, its roots in the, uh, the National Information Infrastructure hearings in 1995, back when the people were talking about the um, information superhighway. Uh, and Al Gore had these hearings to figure out what to do about the demilitarization of the Internet, the commercialization of the Internet. And uh, this guy who was the Microsoft, uh, a Microsoft copyright guy who'd become Clinton's copyright czar showed up and said, uh, I've got this awesome proposal we should license all copies inside a computer, like, like the RAM and like the frame buffer and the network buffer. All of those should have a, a signed contract and a license fee associated with them. 
And, you know, Gore, to his internal credit, told him to go pound sand. So he went to the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is the UN agency that makes copyright treaties and has the same relationship to dumb copyright law that Mordor has to evil. And he, he got them to pass a treaty that was just way crazier than anything you would have gotten through the Clinton administration. And then in 1998, the Clinton administration ratified it in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So they kind of did, they, they, they couldn't get a hearing at home, so they got a hearing in Geneva and then brought it home. Yeah. What do you think about Antigua's response, sanctioned by the UN? To, it's pretty uh, funny. Yeah, I mean, just speaking about the UN and copyright. Yeah. Like, well, we'll see where it goes. So that long story short, Antigua's in the World Trade Organization. The World Trade Organization has a treaty that says that you can't discriminate against foreign industry. Um, Antigua's main industry is being an internet casino. America prohibits internet casinos, but has a domestic casino industry, which is viewed as protectionism. They went to trade court. They sued the United States government. The United States government lost. They appealed. They lost again. And the World Trade Organization has said, you're right. The United States owes you a passel of money for interfering with your trade. And the way that you can take it out of their hides is by pirating American works and selling them. And uh, so they're, they're allegedly setting up a marketplace. My feeling is that they're going to use this as a lever to change American law or get a better trade, neg trade agreement out of the U.S., and that we'll never see it. But if we do, that would be kind of interesting, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah. So on, on that change, right, so do we think that Aaron's system of using networks to gather votes across uh, California in that example, do you think that is possible? I totally think it's possible. Yeah, the sure. question is, would Aaron's system for doing this work? The last check-in Aaron had to GitHub, which is the big free software open source repository, was on a project that's clearly related to that. So yeah, no, I think it is totally possible. Um, and, and inevitable, and it won't work forever. It'll work once, right? And then the other side will have some kind of response, and then we'll invent something better. The thing that makes me optimistic about this is that every day more people realize that the network is important to them. You know, uh, nerds say bad things about their grandmothers, and I don't understand why. I mean, my grandmother is not techie, but that's not because she's stupid. It's because she was in her mid-80s and felt like she had better things to do with her remaining years on this earth than watch progress bars, right? So <laughs> then when my daughter was born, and I live in London, she lives in Toronto, she was like, well, the only way I'm going to get to see my great-granddaughter more than the two weeks a year that Corey's in Toronto is by figuring out Skype. So she figured out Skype because it's just Skype. And now when we talk about these issues, for her, it's not about abstract information policy, it's about her great-grandchild. And that's the issue, that's the way that we'll win this, is, be, is because every day that goes by, more people care about this stuff for more reasons. And they don't know it, but they're all on this side of the fight, and they, they will get there. I gave this talk in Seattle, and a woman in the audience said, I hear you talk about device security, and it scares the heck out of me. How will I ever secure my devices? Uh, and I said, yeah, I can't secure my devices. The way we secure, imagine I'd given you a talk on waterborne parasites. And afterwards you went, oh my gosh, there's some horrible things living in the water. How will I ever secure my water supply? I can't build a water treatment facility. I can't run a sewer system. We don't do it on our own. We do it by having a society of laws where those laws are good and reflect the public interest, right? We won't get good information hygiene by each of us establishing it. We'll get good information hygiene by each of us demanding it together. And that's, I think, how we'll make the difference. So uh, a couple more questions. Yeah. How paranoid are you with your personal computers and personal devices? I'm pretty paranoid. I have an encrypted hard drive. I, I'm not as paranoid as I could be. You know, there's, um, there's a, a, an attack against encrypted hard drives where you can take a sleeping machine and, and gain access to the computer um, by plugging in firewire devices or devices that, that trick the fi um, firewire interface. Uh, and I don't, uh, I, uh, so that means that you should basically, whenever the, your computer isn't in your hands, you should shut it down. Uh, or your encrypted hard drive is kind of worthless against a determined adversary, and I don't do that. But, I, uh, but I'm pretty secure, but I use PGP for e sensitive email. I sign my email even when I don't encrypt it. Uh, actually, I use GPG, which is the free version. Um, I use proxies, I use Tor. Uh, I use iPredator in Sweden, the, the pirate based proxy a lot. Um, that's a that's a very well run proxy. I mean, if there's one thing you can say about the Pirate Bay is they have totally badass systems administrators, right? <laughs> uh, and so it's a great proxy, and it's cheap, five bucks a month. You can password on your phone. Oh yeah, I've got a big crazy. I, actually, I forgot because when I got it, I was like, we well, should go big or go home. So I have a big crazy unlock code, and then someone from a hack space who came out to the Portland gig looked over my shoulder and went, oh my god, is that your unlock code? <laughs> and he wrote like a whole article about how how um, 
how inadequate my unlock code made him feel. <laughs> 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 Very funny. Yeah. How are you uh, teaching your daughter about the things that are important to you with regards to stuff? How am I teaching my daughter about this stuff? It's a really good question. I mean, she's only five, so the issue hasn't come out much. Um, you know, one of the things is that we, I guess we, we although we uh, do trivial things with our computers, we talk about them with some gravitas in our house. And I think that that may make a difference there. Um, and I don't know exactly how we'll go about it when the time comes. I mean, I think the, the most important thing is to, is to teach kids to open the box uh, and, to, and to reconfigure them. Because it's, it's easy to like assume that the reason that your computer can't do X is because X is impossible, it's physics. Right, and and maybe the reason your your computer can't do X is because of business, and X might help you out an awful lot. And so I think if you get kids involved in programming in hardware, we've got some snap circuits at home that, that she's been playing with that are really fun if you're a little kid. Uh, and you know we're, we 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 do some making. Uh, we've just got a replicator in, a 3D printer, and we're, we're doing stuff like printing doll furniture, and I think that's like a gateway drug to, um, how would you like to change the doll furniture? Like, here's SketchUp, or here's the, the Autodesk app. Uh, let's, let's try tweaking the dollhouse furniture and printing it again. I think getting the sense that, like, the world is configurable makes it hard for people to convince you that it's not. Yeah. You know, just a comment. That actually brings up another interesting thing. We have a lot of collisions occurring with 3D printing technology, mm -hmm. copyright, mm -hmm. um, constitutional law, mm -hmm. uh, Second Amendment rights. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a it's yeah. an interesting change that we're going to be seeing here because, you know, this technology, especially with us manufacturers not wanting to implement some of the things that the government wants us to do, uh, people in the government want us to have protection so that we can't print a gun. Right. Right. Well, or that's never going to happen because this is an open source design. This is an open source. Cat's out of the bag. It's not going back in. And and to to be clear, not because printing guns is good or printing guns is bad or because you you do or don't want to, but because there is that's a computer, right? And there is no model, no theoretical model for a general purpose computer that runs all the programs except for one that pisses off a regulator. Our closest approximation is just a computer with spyware. It's the computer with the I can't let you do that data program. And that program, if the, if the device is open, it, it takes the form of an icon on the desktop labeled HAL9000.exe. And you drag it into the trash, and you can do whatever you want with your program. So the reason we can't make 3D printers that can't print gun parts is not because it's good or bad, but because it's a fool's errand. right? Um, and it's like making lathes that can't machine barrels. right? It, we, 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 it's, it's not that I want guns around me. I'm actually not a gun user or owner, and they scare the heck out of me. I'm Canadian, right? Um, <laughs> it, it's, that, it's that I recognize that if we are going to have some sort of meaningful gun control, we have to actually take steps that are meaningful and not steps that are wishful thinking. Like, if only people who want to kill each other don't think about dragging this icon in the trash, this will work awesomely, is, is, not, a, is not an answer. Um, and then if our answer to that, if we swallow that spider to catch the fly, and our answer to the, to the spider that we've now ingested is, oh, well, we'll just make it illegal for people to look inside how their devices work, well, that makes the problem much worse. You know, on the internet they say, now you have two problems, right? Now you have two problems. You know, you've got, now you've got to go around and arrest people who look inside their computers and figure out how they work. So yeah, I, I really, I, I, I'm very anxious about it. Although I think that the problems of 3D printers have been not well understood as yet. We, we started off with people saying, when we have 3D printers, uh, there will be copyright problems with it. It's probably true. And then people said, uh, and you know, when we have 3D printers, there will be um, uh, you know, people making solid state meth labs. And that's probably true too, right? Uh, and, and this corresponds approximately to the two things that science fiction writers are supposed to do. The first one was, you know, someone had said the science fiction writer should imagine the car in the movie theater and invent the drive-in. And then some wag, I think it was Gardner Dozois, said, oh, no, but the car that you, you know, the science fiction writer should consider the drive-in and invent the sexual revolution. Um, but, you know, the, the impact of the, the, the drive-in and the sexual revolution isn't just the drive-in and the sexual revolution. It's that young people in America who'd committed no crime and weren't in the army started carrying identity papers all the time. And, you know, driver's licenses. And you had to have a license. You had to have a, a piece of, of identification issued by the government in order to participate in everyday life as a consequence of the automotive era. And that's where the database nation comes from, for better or for worse. And so what we haven't figured out is what's the, what's the weird third order effect of, of 3D printers? Solid state meth labs, guns, copyright infringement, trademark infringement, patent infringement. 
almost certainly. Like dollars to donuts will get that. I, I think all I think all of those things are insufficiently weird in terms of what the, the future consequences of a 3D printer will be. So one more question and then we're done. Yes? How would you recommend young people um, like 12 or 13 get into and learn about and get into politics? Learn about and get into politics. That's a great question. Um, so there's, you mean information politics or party politics or what? Like, like working on this stuff or, I mean, all the parties have youth auxiliaries, but that'll just get you into the machine. Um, I think that you could, um, gosh, no one's asked me that on this question. I hear a lot of how would I get into technology but not into politics. I think that uh, you would probably find Students for Free Culture to be a great starting point. Um, I think, let me think. That's a good answer to that. I want to give you a good one and not just sort of blow you off. Uh, get into politics. Join your local hackerspace. Well, join your local hackerspace, but that's like doing is politics, which is cool. You know, the, the, the deed is political. But, um, yeah, actually, that's a really good idea. Uh, <laughs> so, actually, no, I've got a great one for you. Like, if so, you want to talk to a bunch of weirdos that spend all day thinking about this kind of stuff. That's true. Instead of waiting for Cory Doctor to come to town. Yeah. Come hang out at High Point Three on a Tuesday night. Yeah, no, that's you, you'll get that's awesome. Money. That's that's great. That's a great answer. I have another one for you though. So your school, if it receives federal funding, ha it has to comply with a law called COPA, and COPA says that they have to put spyware on the network to stop you from looking at dirty pictures. So there will be a filter on your network, which you probably experienced. You go to a page that you think is innocuous, and there's like a, a page that says you may not access this. No, uh, uh, right. What's not widely understood by the people who buy these systems, put these systems in, or administer them, is that in order to stop you from looking at bad things, I have to look at everything you're looking at. So in order to stop you from looking at the bad pages, I have to intercept all of your clicks. So that's total continuous surveillance of everything you do on the school network in order to stop you from looking at bad stuff. And what's also not widely appreciated is that school boards don't write their own censorware. They buy it from vendors. And the vendors who make censorware, their major customers aren't school boards. Their major customers are repressive governments in the Middle East. So they start off by saying, what is it that they need in Bahrain and Syria? And then they repackage it for your school. So you've got these guys who are basically war criminals making big money from your school board that could be spent on stuff that you need for your education and being paid it in order to spy on you at school and harvest all of your data, right? So what I think you should do about this is um, try to make a lasting change in your school and across the country with it, because this, this will require serious legal reform to make a difference in. And the way to do it is by starting locally. Uh, start with your fellow students, do an ethnography, go around and say, um, have you ever tried to access a website that you thought was legitimate but was blocked? And that happens all the time. Uh, at EFF, they did a study about five, six years ago, and they looked at the top 100 pages for the top 100 keywords in the common curriculum, and they found that something like 25% of it was inc incorrectly blocked by the major sensor rare vendors, and that it went way up when you were talking about reproductive health, breast cancer, GBLT issues, and so on, or LGBT issues, rather, and so on. So th it's way overblocked because, you know, there aren't enough, like, easily offended people in the world to sit in front of computers and rank all the websites and find the ones that kids shouldn't see, right? Even if they all worked for every hour that God sent for the rest of time, they would, you know, they, we'd hit the heat death of the universe before they found all the bad things, right? The other thing about it is that, um, is that there are bad things that they miss, right? And so there's lots of sort of mind-searing, awful, like, I wish I could unsee that stuff that you will see even if there's the network filter on it. So you have a thing that doesn't help, that actively hurts and spies on you. So find out from your fellow students when they've been incorrectly blocked, find out when they've got, seen things that should have been blocked, and then ask your teachers. Because I talk to teachers about this, and they say, oh yeah, I queue up a video in the morning for my afternoon class, and then over the lunch break it gets blocked. And, you know, afternoon class comes around, it's like, well, I guess we're doing worksheets today because the thing that I'd built my lesson plan around is gone. So uh, talk to your teachers and then talk to the students about the vulnerabilities in these networks because they're very bad. They're very easy to get around. And I hear from students all the time about how they get around. And I don't advise you to try and get around it because if you do, you'll get into trouble. What you should do instead was document is document how unfit for purpose it is, how easy this high-tech security system is, how you can go to Google and say, how do I get around my school's proxy and hit return and get around this very expensive piece of spyware that they're, that they're paying for that's not doing you any good. And then 
file Freedom of Information Act requests to find out how much money they're spending and uh, um, where, the, uh, where the money's going, who it's going to, and present it to everybody. Present it to your class, present it to your principal, present it to your school board, present it to your town hall meeting, and, and start making a difference. Put it online, tell me about it, I'll put it on Boing Boing. We'll get other students to do it. I've been telling students to do this for years. No one's taken me up on it yet. If we can get students across this country to start documenting the huge amounts of money that's being spent for, to no good end with companies that have no business getting it, and uh, to the great detriment of our educational system, that will be the start of how we make a change. We'll create the evidentiary record for change. So there's my political advice. <laughs> all right, thank you all. Do you have uh, housekeeping stuff here? Oh, just a little bit.